So thank you for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, I'll be speaking about Hilborn modular eigen variety at classical at exotic and CM points of weight one. Uh, this is based on joint work with Adele Bettina and Francesc Fitte. Uh, since this is a short talk, I might be a bit fast and I might skip some of the things. I might not give credit. We'll see. As everyone here is tired and everyone wanted coffee, but you have to listen to my talk instead. So I apologize for that. Okay, so loosely speaking, Eigen varieties are basically rigid analytic varieties which periodically interpolate automorphic forms over for some reductive group. And they are parameterized by weight. And they are constructed using, or they are made up of Hecke operators. They are constructed by gluing Hecke operators, some Hecke algebras. And today, the Eigen variety that we are going to focus on, it parameterizes Hilbert modular Eigen forms. And it was constructed by Andrietta, Iwita, Piloni. So let's start with some notation. So let F be a totally real field. And suppose the uh, degree of F over Q is N. And let P1 up to PR, they look like rho, but they are P's, be the primes of F lying up of P. And let n be an ideal inside OF. OF is the ring of integers of F. And this n is an ideal such that P does not divide n. Oh, I did not say P be a prime. I just, I should say. And P be a prime. So otherwise, this doesn't make sense. OK. So now, what Andrieta Iovita Pilan did is they constructed constructed a periodic rigid analytic variety which we are going to call E, which interpolate, so interpolating cuspidal Hilbert modular, so HM is the short form for Hilbert modular, cuspidal Hilbert modular eigenforms of team level M or team level N and weights of same parity over F such that so now I'll list the properties. It satisfies some very nice properties. So E is equidimensional of dimension n plus 1. And this interpolation is done in, in such a way that the Hecke operators define uh, the Hecke operators TL, SL for L prime not dividing NP and UPI for all pi dividing p, they define globally analytic functions on E. That's what I said when, when I said that they are made up of Hecke operators. And if you take a, a QP bar point of this eigen variety, then it corresponds to an overconvergent cuspidal uh, Hilbert, oh sorry, HM eigenform fx of finite slope. Finite slope means UPI eigenvalues are non-zero for all PI. So UPI eigenvalue of fx is non-zero for every, for every PI dividing P. So, and this fx is such that if you, if you want to look at the TL eigenvalue of fx, that's just evaluation of this analytic function TL at x, that gives you the TL eigenvalue of fx. Similarly, UPI eigenvalue of fx is evaluation of UPI at x of fx. Okay, and classical points are Zariski dense.
So basically, the points x such that the corresponding fx is a classical Hilbert modular eigenform, a cuspidal classical Hilbert modular eigenform, those points are Zariski dense. Now, this is really a nice property because of which we get a pseudo character. T from gf and p to the ring of analytic functions over e such that t of from l is tl for all l not dividing n p. So this is the Galois group of the maximal unramified extension of uh, maximal extension of f unramified outside n p and infinity. And if you know what, if you don't know what a pseudo character is, it roughly is a function which behaves like trace of a representation. So in this case, it's a two-dimensional pseudo-character, which means it behaves like a trace of a two-dimensional representation. I mean, this representation may not exist, but the properties are really close. OK, and most importantly, there exists a weight map, kappa, from E to W. I'll define W in just a moment, which is locally finite. where this W is the rigid analytic space corresponding to the completed group algebra of T of ZP cross Zp star, where T is just restriction of Gm from OF to Z. So this weight map, it roughly sends every point to its weights. But I only say roughly because this is of dimension n plus 1, and there are only n weights. So there is some normalization happening, which I won't tell. But, but basically, the idea is that it sends it to its weights. Uh, so this is a really nice eigenvariety because it's, uh, it is satisfying all these nice properties. There have been some other construction before in this context, like Hira constructed ordinary families. Then there is a construction of Bazard and Braska. This Kasei has constructed something. Urban, Emerton, Kisin Lai. So the Andrieta Uita uh, Piloni paper, it has a nice uh, summary of all this construction in the introduction. So I would like, uh, I would recommend to read that for more details. The, the only thing I want to mention is the kissin lie eigen variety, where they interpolate parallel weight Hilbert modular forms. So it's a one-dimensional eigen variety. You could call it kissin lie eigen curve if you want. And when you, when you restrict this construction of Andrieta Iota Piloni to parallel weights, we sort of recover the kissin lie eigen curve, the cuspidal part of it. So studying the geometry of this will also tell you something about the geometry of the cuspidal part of the kissin lie eigen curve. OK, now I have said what eigenvariety I am looking at. Now let's talk about the points that I am looking at. So now let f be a parallel weight one, Hilbert modular eigenform, cuspidal. So everything I am saying is going to be cuspidal unless I mention otherwise, of level m and tame level n. over f, then a p-stabilization of f with finite slope defines a point on E. So what's a p-stabilization? P-stabilization is basically another eigenform of of tame level n, whose eigenvalues away from np are same as eigenvalues of f, and it is also an eigenform for the UPIs. So it's the same piece, it's the generalization of the p-stabilization of modular forms that you know, and it's obtained in exactly the same way. But now there are r primes of f above p, so there are two to the r different p-stabilization potentially. And there could be less if the eigenvalues coincide. And we denote 
a P stabilization. of f by f gamma i, and the notation is such that the UPI eigenvalue of f gamma i is basically gamma i. That's how we, that's how we denote it. Okay? Now, I'm going to define notion of something called as p regular, because that's the assumption I'm going to keep. It's, you might also know it in the, in the form of p distinguished, but I guess this is uh, Belage Dimitrov's notation that I'm going to have. So let alpha pi and beta pi be the roots of polynomial x squared minus a pi f x plus psi of pi. So this is p pi eigenvalue of f. If pi does not divide the level, and UPI eigenvalue of f, if pi divides the level. And this, psi is the nebentipus, and psi of pi, we, we define it to be zero if pi divides m, as otherwise uh, nebentipus does not really make sense. So let alpha pi and beta pi be the roots of this polynomial. So there is one polynomial for every pi. And we say that we say that f is p regular if alpha pi and beta pi are not equal. Sorry, for all pi dividing p. So for every i, if this polynomial has distinct roots then we say that the point is, uh, the f is p regular. And so, so, the, so the, the gamma eigenvalues of p stabilization is going to be one of these alpha pi and beta pi. Okay? So now, let me give the aim of the talk. Now our aim is to study geometry of E at a point uh, corresponding at the point corresponding to a, a p stabilization f gamma i of f of finite slope for a p regular f. So given a p regular f of parallel width 1, I want to take a p stabilization of finite slope, and I want to study the uh, geometry of E at the point corresponding to that, uh, to that uh, p stabilization of finite slope. Okay, I don't have enough time for writing down the motivation for this, but so, so the motivation could be like for defining periodic L functions, these results of ethalness and smoothness of the eigenvariety are, are pretty useful. And also, uh, for there is a connection with explicit class field theory found by Darman, Lauder, and Roger, where they use this geometry results of uh, eigen curve at such a point to write the coefficients of certain over-convergent uh, generalized eigenforms in terms of periodic logarithms of some units in an algebraic extension. And also, another, another application could be studying how many uh, primitive Hida families pass through a point? If there are more than one, how do they intersect? And such questions. Okay. Now let me uh, let me do some uh, some jumping. I'll state my results first, and then I'll talk about what is known before. Because I guess I only have about 15 minutes more, so it's better to have the main results first and then history later. Okay, uh, yeah, one more important thing I forgot to tell. To this f, there is a Galois representation from GFM to GL2C, such that trace of prop Q is TQ eigenvalue of f, where Q does not divide M, 
and determinant of prop Q is the evaluation of the Nebentipus at Q. So this is due to the work of Rogowski, Tunnel, Wiles, and Ota. And so the projective image of this, we know it's either a dihedral group or A4, S4, A5. So in, in, in the theorem that I'm going to state, I'm going to put some restriction on the projective image of rho f, which is why I had to mention this. And this has finite image, as all of you know, because it's an art in representation. So the first result that we prove is the following. So we call this point corresponding to such p-stabilization as x. And now I state the results in terms of x. So suppose f over q is Galois, and either projective image of rho f is A4, S4, A5, or f is Cm, which means there is a quadratic extension, which is Cm, and the character of that Galois group of that extension, such that rho f is induced from the character from that character of the quadratic extension. And suppose a periodic Schonel conjecture is true, then kappa is et al at x, and hence the eigenvariety is smooth at x. So we have three assumptions. F is Galois over Q, projective image is either A4, 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 A5, or F is CM, and periodic channel conjecture is true. In that case, we have that the kappa is et al and E is smooth at x. Now this periodic channel conjecture is a big hammer. What it says is that if, I mean roughly the, the statement is, if you have n linear, if you have n algebraic numbers, whose periodic logarithms are linearly independent over Q, then the periodic logarithms are also algebraically independent over Q. So it's a very strong conjecture. It implies Leopold's conjecture. So it's really a big hammer that we are using. But I'll expl explain in a bit why we need that, uh, this such a big conjecture. And it's natural to ask if we could relax some of the hypothesis of the theorem. And the answer is we can, but not the most important one that we would like to we instead relax this one and this one. So this gets us to theorem two. So suppose f is CM. So rho f is basically induced by a character of uh, from a character of GK, which we call chi, K is CM, K over Q, uh, K over F as tension 2. Now then, if periodic Schonel conjecture is true, if there's no, yeah, if the periodic Schonel conjecture is true, then E is smooth at X. And if none of the PIs, these are the primes of F lying above P, are split in K, and Leopold's conjecture is true, then E is smooth at X. So we are not assuming that f is Galois over q, and then we are saying that if f has cm and periodic channel is true, then e is smooth at x. But on the other hand, if there is a stronger hypothesis which holds, which is none of the pi's are split in k, so each pi is either inert or unramified, then only Leopold's conjecture is enough to conclude the smoothness. So this is the only part where we get some relief from not assuming this periodic channel conjecture.
Sorry. Uh, yeah. No, I think we need it for K. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not, not. Yeah, even this periodic Schonel conjecture is, so, so the reason why we need this conjecture is that while doing our proof, we get an n by n matrix where n is the degree of f over q whose entries are q bar linear combinations of periodic logarithms of some units. And we want the determinant to be non-zero to conclude what we want. Now if, so that's why we need periodic Schonel conjecture just for that determinant to be non-zero. So in a specific case, maybe you could just compute it by hand or on computer, and you know that the determinant is non-zero, then the result follows. But in general, it's not clear why that determinant should be non-zero, but periodic Schonel conjecture gives you a nice, uh, nice way of showing that the determinant is non-zero. That's a good question. Actually, uh, so the problem, the, the, the way this proof goes is that we take the completed local ring at the point, and there you get a uh, nearly ordinary deformation of this rho f on that point. And then we calculate the dimension of the tangent space of the corresponding deformation ring. Now, because in, in these cases, when we assume all these conjectures, the, the, we get the right dimension. But if there is no conjecture, then we only have this dimension of this uh, or, uh, deformation ring. And there's no way of comparing it with the, with the local ring of the eigen variety. So, so if, there, if we start allowing the defects, we only have this calculation on the deformation side without the information that we have the isomorphism between the deformation ring and the local ring. It's only because this tangent space dimension calculation works out after assuming this conjecture it, it, it becomes the right, right uh, dimension so that we can conclude this map is an isomorphism. Okay, since I have some more time, now I'll go back and tell you what is known about such things before, because I just told you this result without even giving any background on what's known for Eigen curve and what's known for Hilbert modular varieties. Okay, maybe I'll just write here. I do have time, I do have five minutes, good. So history. So in the case of Eigen curve, we have, we know the best possible result due to Belaish and Dimitrov. So what Belaish and Dimitrov prove is that the Eigen curve C, which is constructed by Coleman and Mazur, is smooth at a weight at a classical weight one p regular point and the weight map is not etal if and only if this rho f is isomorphic to a uh, to a induction of a character from a gk to gq where k is real and quadratic, and P is split in K. This is the only case where the weight map is not etal, and it's etal everywhere else. And the Eigen curve is anyway smooth at any classical weight one point. This is the result that Belaish and Dimitrov prove, and they have no assumption on the periodic, the transcendence conjectures like Leopold's conjecture or periodic Schonel conjecture. And I think, this direction, like if f has the real multiplication, sorry, the backward direction, was also known due to Cho and Watson, maybe under some additional assumptions. And Dimitrov and Gatti gave examples of, of uh, non-smooth uh, weight one points, classical, which are irregular at P. So this regularity condition does not hold. So for, for such a point, they have some counter examples uh, which say that the Eigen curve is not smooth at such points. So this P regularity condition is really necessary. And in, in, in the case of Hilbert modular variety, like in case of this, this setting, there are few partial results known before 
uh, due to myself and Bettina, but we worked on it independently at that time in our respective thesis. E, partial results of on geometry of on like smoothness plus etalness and non-etalness. So we have both kind of results. Are known under either Leopold's, uh, Leopold's conjecture or Pierre-Ixonel conjecture due to self and Bettina. So both of us have to assume one of these. I mean, Bettina's results are mostly conditional on Leopold's conjecture. And my results, I have to assume either this or pierre Schonel conjecture in, in, in every case. Uh, in, in very few cases, we could remove the hypothesis of this pierre Schonel or Leopold, because at that, in, in those cases, it is true. That's why we could remove. Uh, now, you could ask that uh, Belage dimitrov result, oh, I missed an E. So you could ask that Belage dimitrov result is very clean, right? It is not, it is giving us the, the perfect result. And there are no additional assumptions like periodic Schonel or Leopold needed. So you could ask, how did they manage it? And the, and the answer is that, as I told you before, we get this n by n matrix whose determinant we want to be non-zero. But in their case, f is equal to q, so that n is 1. So basically, they get some q bar linear combination of periodic logarithms which they can show is non-zero using baker bruma theorem. That's why they don't need any of these nasty conjectures. And since we are following their part of the proof, uh, we, need, uh, we need such conjectures to assume. OK, I think I'm almost done here, so I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>